Hello and welcome to theCUBE and the Analyst Angle. I'm so excited to be here today talking to you. I'm Rob Strecce, I'm one of the lead analysts here with theCUBE and SiliconANGLE Media. And we're going to be talking about data products, governance, and the modern data platforms and how this is really shifting around. And I'm really excited to be joined by Lior Gavish, who's the CTO and co-founder of Monte Carlo. And we're going to have some fun discussions about this and really get into how the modern data stack and governance and all of these pieces are moving around and why it's important to understand where that all is and have that observability inside there. So thank you for joining me. Thanks Rob, it's great to be here. Yeah, so why don't we jump into it? And I, I, Both of us have been in this space for quite a bit, you for even longer and talking to a lot of customers. What we see is that there are different pieces of the modern data stack and it keeps evolving. You have Databricks, you know, buying people like Mosaic ML, there's more AI, you have everybody talking about LLMs. And I think one of the things that seems to be really confusing is what is the modern data stack and how is it evolving? How are, how are you seeing it from the customers that you talk to? Uh, so from my perspective, uh, the modern data stack is a um, set of tools, uh, mostly cloud-based, um, that really started maybe 10 years ago and allowed companies to handle data and get value out of it in a way that's never been possible before. Uh, basically putting a lot of data on the cloud, transforming it, aggregating it, manipulating in various ways, and then producing various kinds of data products, if you will, uh, out of it. Um, uh, and the advent of the cloud, uh, and the advent of all these tools that work together, whether it's the data warehouse like Snowflake and BigQuery and, and increasingly Databricks uh, and Redshift, uh, or whether it's the tools around it, the BI layer, the orchestration tools, the, the ETLs that have built, built around it and DVT yeah. uh, to drive transformation. So all these tools um, are best in breed. They do what they do really well, but they also actually work really well together and give people a way to build a data stack that actually performs well out of the box, requires um, much less maintenance, uh, and allows people to really focus on, on deriving value and insight out of data. Um, and so the modern data stack has been a boon, uh, <laughs> essentially, uh, for data teams, uh, which is very exciting, I think. Uh, where it's evolving right now, or where I feel we're, we're maturing, is we're starting, uh, you know, after we've crammed all of our data in and built a lot of things and try to figure out how to, how to make sense of it all, uh, it's now time, or we see companies kind of going back to the foundations and the basics and starting to think about, like, how, how do we make all of this thing, uh, how do we productize all this thing? Like, how do we really create data products that are, trusted and uh, discoverable and usable and that really drive impact in the business. Yeah. Um, which adds an, a new layer of, of complexity and questions. Uh, and and it's, it's a very exciting time. And I think most recently, you know, one of the biggest ways people believe they can add value is by uh, working with AI and LLMs. And that's, that's, you know, probably the new exciting frontier of the modern data stack. Um, so all of these things are, are super exciting for me as, as, as kind of someone that's part of the industry. Yeah, no, I, I think you hit on a really good thing and I, I think uh, I was having a conversation with Dave Vellante, one of the other analysts and one of the co-founders for theCUBE and we were talking and I think uh, Snowflake and Databricks get a lot of the press but there's still a ton of people using BigQuery. I mean, especially the ones that were you know, using uh, Google Analytics to push their, you know, data into there to get that and trying to do customer 360. Are you seeing kind of a good spread amongst, you know, Snowflake and Databricks and BigQuery? Are you starting to see some of the other ones from Microsoft? And I mean, there's also Redshift over on the AWS side that we hear about every now and again as well. But what are you seeing out there from a, what people are building? Are they having one or multiple of them? How is that working? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not a modern data stack snob. Yeah. I'm not going to say that yeah. well, that a certain tool is part or not part of the of the modern data stack. And I, and I think that's what we're also seeing out there. Yeah. Um, really, people end up choosing the best tool for their 
job, right? And sometimes, many times it's snowflake, uh, many times it's Databricks, many times it's both. Yeah. Um, but there's also good reasons to use BigQuery. It's a great data warehouse, and for people that have a lot of their data com coming out of GCP, makes a lot of sense to go with Databricks with uh, with BigQuery. Um, and so we're really seeing, uh, you know, a good uh, balance between all of these. And for many companies, there's actually multiple yeah. tools, like you alluded to, because, you know, even within the same company, like different teams will have different needs and, and different strategies, um, and, and and different personas that make the choices, uh, and that drives a lot of the the, the the tech choices. And so definitely seeing all of them. Yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, what we're hearing as well. And I, I think, in fact, when we looked at some of the ETR data, which is our partner uh, that does research around this, they actually showed that there was an overlap between Databricks and Snowflake that it's, it's when you look at Databricks customers, 44% of them or something in that neighborhood also have Snowflake. And I, I, I bet if we had put BigQuery into that as well, you would see yet again another level of uh, that. And I. I tend to agree with you. I think it's the right tool for the right purpose at the right cost as well. And I think that's uh, where people are, because they have different agreements. Maybe your agreement's up with Google after two years and you want to go to Redshift because they give you a good deal at AWS or what have you. I'm, I'm not a snob on <laughs> that either. So I, I think uh, right tool for the right thing. But I think you hit on a really good point there around personas and I, and I think that uh, there's been the rise, and I actually did a podcast back in January on, on data products and data product management, and it's the rise of the data product manager. Uh, myself, having been you know, head of product of a couple different companies, I kind of look at it and you, know, you have to build these data products out and productize them. What are, what are you seeing in the data product realm? What, are you, what is becoming more important uh, from what you're seeing from your customers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, um, maybe let's define data products, right? Yeah. So uh, the idea of a product is that uh, you build something, and then you put it in the hands of other people, uh, and then they find value out of it, right? They get something that they need out of that product. And I think uh, data products always existed, but uh, if you look back maybe 10, 20 years ago, the form was this binder that someone <laughs> yeah. uh, prepared for a month or two or three months before the end of the quarter and submit, physically submitted to, um, to the executive team or, or whatever. Um, and that world has changed quite a bit, right? Like today we put data in the hands of a lot of people and a lot of organizations, right? Like every single person is making decisions out of data, oftentimes from dashboards that you might have on in Tableau or Looker or something else. Um, but it's sometimes, uh, or increasingly maybe, uh, a large language model uh, that's that's interacting with people, um, or it could be uh, a, a data set that a data scientist uses to to do a certain analysis or it could be sometimes an application that automates things for the business, whether it's marketing spend or pricing and risk or things like that. And so it's kind of taken a lot of different shapes um, and needs to be done differently because once you have so many products in the hands of so many people, you really have to think about scale and like how to actually expose it in a way that's repeatable and trusted findable, right? In the same way that we think about any product in the real world, yeah. like you need to make sure people are able to know that it exists if they have the need. You need to make sure that they understand how to use it and how to consume it. Um, and you need to make sure it's at the level of trustworthiness and quality that's required for the job, right? And that, I think, is a new set of tools that, um, or a new set of disciplines yeah. that data teams are increasingly adopting in order to support those data products and make them a success and really drive value in, in, in the enterprise. Yeah, I, I've been on this kick around uh, data products and governance and being able to understand, because like you said, the trustworthiness, and I think we're seeing that, I mean, all of the people who are tweeting about how there's uh, entropy within ChatGPT and you know, it, what took you know, two seconds is now taking 
or coming back wrong even from, from an analysis perspective. And I think that that to me is where you start to lose people is if you can't do it repeatedly over and over and over again. And I, I think with data products, they have to be that. You have to know the lineage. You have to understand where things came from, how, because, you know, having, I started my, my career as a DBA really long time ago. And when I looked at that and started out down that, and I would go and run these reports, like you said, it was manually. We had a dot matrix printer where we, I was in, at a university and we would ship out I was the DBA for the person who shipped out all those huge mailings that people get in the mail. And we had to print the labels. Well, something would change. Somebody would go and change the format of the address or add something in, and it would change the, <laughs> the way it printed out. I had to then go track back to why something changed and how the data changed coming into what was our data product, which was this mailing list at the time. And I think that, I think you hit on a really good point, which is, for me, it was near impossible, you know, where I lived within that stack, and we're also talking about the 90s, so I'm dating myself a little bit, where it was, you know, I was using very rudimentary SQL tools to, to go and understand that. But I, I think, like you said, things have changed. How are they evolving? So, and, because it's gotta be more complex at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I mean, the level of complexity increased, the number of data products, the uh, number of different data sources that are feeding, and the number of different stages uh, that the data goes through before it gets into a product. Um, and I think, uh, or, or at least in Monte Carlo, we believe there are some good analogies to learn from how um, reliability and trust is handled in software systems, which are um, as complex, or sometimes even more. Um, and there's some common methodologies around that. Um, it's, it's usually called DevOps, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a set of practices of how you actually deliver software in a way that's reliable and trusted, um, and a set of tools that come with it, right? Um, and first and foremost, and a, a topic that's near and near to my heart is observability, right? This idea that at all times you can actually um, collect a lot of information from the data stack, specifically metadata, logs, metrics, statistics, uh, and really understand its health, really understand whether it's working as intended, whether it's doing what it's supposed to do, whether it's delivering information that's accurate and fit for the, for the purpose, um, or whether it's not. And if, if you can tell at every single point in time whether the system is healthy, you can also know when it breaks, right? And you can react to that and we, you can solve that problem proactively rather than uh, impacting uh, your customers, the people that use your products, because that is the way you, you lose trust in a product, right? If it breaks over and over again in a way that its builders don't understand or don't know. Yeah. Um, and so, you know. And that, would, my, that would seem like it fits in with governance and, and really is, Almost the foundation is having that observability and being able to understand where where the data is. Is it healthy? Is the product healthy as that? Yes, we believe it's the it's the cornerstone of, of any governance initiative, and and we're increasingly seeing um, uh, the market adopting it. By now, we've we've served over 250 uh, enterprises that that use observability as a core piece of their stack and a, as a core part of how they deliver trusted uh, data products and not just data products. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I think in, you know, spending my time uh, when I was over on the snowplow front and seeing how people, like you're saying, building data products on top of the first party data that we would deliver into a data warehouse or a data lake or whatever you want to call it, a data mesh or whatever fancy name you want to use with it, and how they would really look to drive, you know, hey, I want to reduce churn by making sure that I have reach out after all of these incidents happen or something like that from a customer service, or actually, to your point about data products, looking at and analyzing their data products and how those data products actually perform. So building a data product on top of 
for a data product to evaluate the health of it. And it would seem that you know, where Monte Carlo is coming from is really digging in and showing how the data product is built out. And that's really what you're, you're announcing this week as well. Right, so Monte Carlo from the get-go really touched on that problem of like data lands in the data warehouse and gets transformed through multiple stages and oftentimes multiple teams in the company before it lands in, you know, in an application that might be designed to reduce churn, right? Yeah. And like, how do you understand how all these things fit together and how they all work in tandem and in, in, in whether they're all performing in the way that they're supposed to? So that's something that Monte Carlo tackled from the get-go. What we're announcing today is the data product dashboard, which is the first time where people can actually have a succinct and clear view of all of the issues that are related to a particular data product. So they can basically go into the tool, define what constitutes the data product, like what are the objects that are actually the data product, whether it's tables or BI reports or models, and really understand uh, not just what's going on with those specific objects, but what's going on with everything that's upstream of them, all the way uh, to those tables that land uh, in the warehouse from from a source system. Um, and that allows people to do things. Uh, one is to understand and prioritize what are the issues that truly matter, right? At one extreme end of the spectrum, you can try to solve only problems that happen at you know, the most downstream part at the data product level, but then you're, it's going to take a long time and be really, really hard to find issues. At the other extreme, you could try to monitor and track every single table you ever had. And that's not scalable either. But if you can really narrow down to like what are the issues that are impacting the most critical assets that I have, the most critical products that I have, it really gives you focus uh, and clarity around how to, how to spend your time and your resources. The other thing that it lets you do is actually communicate with stakeholders, right? There's, in, from a trust perspective, there's a huge difference between you finding out that the address was wrong versus the person that built the system for you telling you, hey, I know the labels are wrong. Hold on, I'm working on it. I'm gonna let you know as soon as it's fixed, right? That yeah. communication makes a huge difference in terms of trust. You can have the exact same number of problems, but if you're able to communicate about it, you're just gonna get a lot more trust and a lot more adoption. Um, and the data product dashboard actually allows you to do that because it allows you to look at the data product, understand is it healthy or not, and if it's not, you're able to go ahead and communicate it to the right stakeholders um, and work to solve it and update them on status. And so it's really designed to help teams both prioritize and build trust around the data products that, they, that they're creating. Yeah, and when I got to take a look at it, I, I think what was neat about it and really, and I think is the fact that you're able to com calculate the importance and uh, based on giving it a metric on how often it's used and how, how many different places it's used and things like that, which I think gives people that visibility that it, you just can't get otherwise. Because I think where we're seeing people building data products, they're actually building data products on top of data products. So you're getting these hierarchical types of uh, interwoven data products. And so those certain tables get really hammered yeah. from a certain set of products. And so if some change was to happen in that exact table, it, has, it can be catastrophic to a number of different products. And I think that's what you guys are really, are, what I can tell focused on is helping people understand that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, you're, a, if you're a software engineer <laughs> building a production system, the data that you're creating is going to get used downstream by a bunch of different data products. And most times you're oblivious to it. You don't even know, you don't know whether it's being used at all. And if, even if it is, like who's using it for what purpose? And that ability to actually map to like a change in this data set that was created in a, in a software application maps to these critical assets and here's how actually allows you to have a much better understanding of what you need to do about it yeah. and how to prioritize issues, right? Like the problem is a lot of things are going to change, but which ones truly matter? 
uh, is difficult, and, and, and having that visibility is something that our customers absolutely love. Yeah, and I, I think it also, to your, to your earlier point about being able to communicate and be transparent, I think it's, you know, the data product manager, the data engineers, the data developers, they all can see this and understand how it all works together. And I, I think to me that was one of the best ways is visually being able to, because the picture is you know, worth at least a thousand words, if not more, to say the least. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that I loved was the fact that it really spoke to me on that level about how it brought those different personas together. Because I think there's still going to be a massive skills gap out there. And I think these types of tooling and observability, uh, much like I've dealt with observability in the infrastructure space and Kubernetes, which is very complex right. systems, but similarly interconnected and interwoven with service meshes and stuff like that, except it's data meshes and data warehouses. And I, I think that to me, there's a good analogy uh, between that because without that visibility, you don't want to be the last person to know that the labels were wrong. You want to be the first person before you go and run 10,000 of them, and then you have to throw that all out. And I, I think that must be where your customers are really focusing on, is how do we make this not only transparent within the teams, but also helping people understand, okay, hey, hold this or revert back and go and fix that before the end customer of that data product is seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a it's a game changer, right? It changes the whole um, conversation in a company from everybody sending sending uh, angry Slack messages <laughs> to the data team to the data team uh, actually understanding what's going on and proactively communicating and and building trust. And it, it, we've seen that some of our customers are actually very diligent and run, uh, con, you know. Uh, Periodic surveys uh, or, uh, that, that measure a bunch of different uh, aspects of how people in the company perceive data. And all of the companies that do that have seen a massive increase in trust in data yeah. um, within uh, a small number of months after implementing an observability tool because it, it, it creates that communication. By the way, that's regardless of whether they have more or fewer issues. Just the, the fact that you're able to own it and know about it and communicate about it uh, makes a whole lot of a difference in terms of how, uh, how data is perceived and how valuable it becomes to the business. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And, and I, I think, again, this is one of those topics that's really key and I think people are super interested in because there's so many more applications that are data applications or data-based applications that are built on multiple data products. And products could be features of those data apps and how they get, to your point, get consumed is one of those things that I think those that new data product manager type role is really focused on. And, you know, tying that back to the business and understanding that, hey, this data product has this revenue associated with it and being able to, that data product manager's butts on the line when, when he's going out there. Are you seeing that as well changing in your customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, all, you know, data teams are aspiring to transition from, um, you know, from fulfilling tickets and asks and doing ad hoc analysis to a place where they can provide products that are usable and consistent and can be consumed. Um, they like everybody. They love building and not reacting to asks, uh, and they want to truly understand what they're building and why they're building and how it's impacting the business. And that's exact. Wh whether there's a person whose title is data product manager, uh, or whether it's someone you know informally doing that, um, it's a role that's so critical for many of the teams that we work with. Right, kind of tying between the business need and the data and really creating something that's sustainable and repeatable and trusted. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. So if people want to learn more about this, what should they do? Um, we're at MonteCarloData.com, so yeah. please visit our website if you'd like. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn if you want to reach out. Um, and yeah, I would love to hear from you. Awesome. 
Well, thank you, Lior, for coming on. And I really appreciate you really helping bring this together. We're going to be talking about data products here on theCUBE quite a bit because I think it's one of these places we really want to dig into and understand because I think there's a lot of uh, different, differing opinions of what a data product is and how it's really dealt with. But thank you and keep it right here with the Cube and the Analyst Angle and we'll bring you more information. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks Rob. Thank you.